call the September 11th meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. We start with the roll call. Andre Spinelli. Here. Jared Gardner. Here. Radhika Krishna. Here. Jim Winchester. Here. Scott Pullis. Here. Jeff Ron. Here. Daniel George. Here. Greg Strike. Here. Brandy Eber is excused. You have a quorum. Thank you. Before we get started, we'll pause for a moment of silence in remembrance of September 11th. Okay, thank you for that. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, motion by Commissioner Polis, seconded by Commissioner Garden. Gardner, any objections to the approval of the Monday, August 14th, 2023 minutes? Hearing none, that motion passes. Um, any disclosures? Sure, I'd like to go ahead and uh, disclose that I am employed by the Anchorage Downtown Partnership, which was listed as a stakeholder in case 2023-0099, um, 4th Avenue signals and lighting upgrades. I don't believe that I have any personal or financial interest in this case, and I believe I can remain impartial, so I am uh, happy to participate. Anyone else? Nope, hearing none. Um, I will disclose that I was absent from case 2023-0059 and 2023-0086 and will not be participating in the consent agenda. I'll also disclose that in the matter of case 2023-0083 I have met with the petitioner. I've discussed this site in the past. And I have no current dealings with the petitioner or contracts to purchase the site or interest in purchasing it currently, although I could be interested in it in the future because I do purchase land and develop it. So I'll disclose that. I'll hand the gavel over to Commissioner Krishna. Thank you. I'll uh, entertain a motion to direct Commissioner Spinelli to participate. Moved by Commissioner Winchester, seconded by Commissioner George. Commissioner Winchester, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, I appreciate your forthrightness and candor, and uh, I know you'll... Uh, You'll, you'll adjudicate accordingly. So I tend to support it. Would anyone else like to speak? Commissioner Strike. Yes, and thank you for the commissioner for um, identifying the concerns. Uh, you didn't go into the discussion of what, you, what was discussed, to what degree the discussions took place, and then when you made the notion that you, you don't currently have a interest in the property for future development, but you're in the business of purchasing down the road, you left it open. And it's, maybe it's the choice of words, but the verbiage that you use left enough openings that in my opinion would conflict you out of participating in this very case. Um, unless you want to speak to the degree and level of the communications that did take place and the um, notion that this is, is not, or because you're in the general um, notion of buying develop and developing property, well, if it's being redeveloped or it's being rezoned, the rezoning may encourage you to 
be in the position to say, now I am interested, because somebody else has gone through the process of getting it rezoned. So this is the conflict I see, and I don't know if it was the choice of words you used, but I think a little bit more elaboration would be in order. If I, I'll just respond to that. Um, as a real estate developer, there is absolutely no piece of property that is off the table for my future plans. Like, that's just kind of, you know, I got a large appetite for what I do. And that, so that's just brutal honesty. I, I couldn't honestly say that there's no, a piece of property that I wouldn't be interested in. And, and that would go for any case, whether I had met with the, the petitioner previously or not. Um, secondly, I, it's not that anyone else up here is in the business of buying and developing land, but anyone up here in theory could also participate in that activity if they chose to on any case that they hear and then move forward in the future. So that's why I don't see it as a conflict. Yeah, yes, but none of us had the conversation with the petitioner prior to it coming before the commission. You're the one that had the conversation prior to. So I'm, I'm, this commission, I don't believe, is cognizant of the discussion itself and whether this was on an advisory discussion or to the depth and degree of that discussion, why it took, even took place. Yeah. Because like you said, any opportunity to develop property is behoven to anyone in this audience, but none of us had the communications with this particular petitioner before it came before this commission. And therein lies the disclosure that you made. Would anyone else like to speak? Commissioner Gardner. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I think for my part, I've always understood the conflict of interest um, kind of requirements as it applies to the commission to be focused on specific conflicts, given that we all are members of this community and we all have interests that are affected by the decisions we make here. I think to my end, from that perspective, it seems like it would be relevant to have a better understanding of the nature of the conversation and, and when it took place and kind of what the scope of that was. Um, I, I don't know, um, you know, to what extent the chair feels comfortable going into those, but I, for myself, I don't know that I could feel comfortable saying there's not a conflict given what we know without just some, some context for what the conversation was. Do you want me to elaborate on that? Commissioner Sp Spinelli, I would say that it's entirely up to you whether you wish to elaborate and the c commission can make their decisions and votes based on the information we have now without need for your um, response unless you really do choose to make that. Yeah, I mean, I, I got no problem saying that um, we spoke on the phone a couple times, I want to say within the last 12 to six, like from between six months ago and 12 months ago, I believe. Um, we met in person one time and we looked at plans, talked about different plans and projects. And um, I did say, well, I don't know how the Muni is going to feel about a rezone on of R3 to B3. But other than that, that was about what we've talked about. Uh, we talked about purchasing a neighbor's land and would I be interested and I don't know. There was a lot of other conversations, and, and I also, we talked about, you know, I, I, my history with, uh, I had a friend who rented space there to store his boat, so, but that's, that's, um, that's about it. I mean, that's about all there is to disclose at this point, um, and I guess I, I wasn't sure the petitioner was moving forward with the case until tonight, so I didn't, haven't been in communication with the petitioner currently and that that's about all of it other than I will say like I'm fine my feelings won't be hurt if I don't participate in the case also so I'll leave it at that would anyone further care to comment seeing none I'll call for a vote That vote fails. Uh, Commissioner Spinelli will be recused from uh, that case.
but first I will hand the gavel back to him. Okay, next item on the agenda is uh, informational item, staff's presentation on case 2023-0099. Yes, thank you, Chair Spinelli. Uh, the street project would reconstruct the traffic signal and street lighting systems along 4th Avenue from Cordova Street to Ingra Street. Uh, this would continue work being completed by the municipality west of Cordova Street. The project may also include sidewalk replacements, uh, pavement replacement, or dr storm drain improvements. This concept report is an information item, and the commission shall take no formal action on the concept report. Uh, the concept report is to familiarize the commission with the project and it's distributed in anticipation of receiving the design study report. Uh, once the design study report is received, it would be reviewed by the Planning and Zoning Commission at a meeting in the future. I did confirm that uh, I am able to schedule the design study report for a public hearing without first bringing it to the Planning and Zoning Commission separately to schedule a public hearing when it is submitted. Uh, I know that's occurred in the, the past few design study reports that we ha have had. So um, code says that the public hearing is at the discretion of the commission for the design study report. Uh, so you could always change it from being a public hearing to not being a public hearing, but I, I can do that in one meeting, I confirmed. Uh, but this item is still just the concept report, an informational item, and members of the project team are available for any questions on this informational concept report but there's uh, no presentation tonight from either the project team or, or from me. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Commissioner Ron. Uh, thank you to the chair. Um, Ms. Alpaby, thanks for the quick presentation. This may go to um, the applicants, a bit of a technical question. Noting that the report does identify two of the recorded crashes in the study area as relating to pedestrians, I'm curious about whether or not the project is considering audible uh, pedestrian cross signals. I would defer the, uh, that question to the project team. Thank you. I have a member of the project team that'd like to Please state your name for the record. You gotta hit the button until the red light comes on. There's a green square. You, you'll see this red light on the microphone when it when you when you get there. You're off again. Hmm. Up. Oh, you're on again. Sorry about that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the commission, uh, my name is Art Johnson. I'm with Kenny Engineering. Uh, to answer your question in regards to audible pedestrian uh, signals, um, that's something we'll have to consider. I know the, the, new, the upcoming PROAG for accessibility um, is considering that, um, but no decision has been made at this time. Any other further questions? Yeah, we have a, they're lining up. Commissioner George. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, I can't let the irony go unaddressed that uh, perhaps an audible signal would have been helpful here. Um, but uh, two quick questions, and maybe you can answer these or maybe not, but um, I noticed that some of the intersections that are uh, planned for upgrade um, sidewalks and will have to be replaced in some cases. Uh, will they be brought up to ADA standard with the, the ramps with texture on them? And then uh, secondly, this may be completely outside of your bailiwick, but um, I noticed that parking meters exist just east of Cordova and 4th. Is there any intention to install those further um, since pavement will be likely replaced in those areas? and this will be upgraded, so will there be additional revenue generation? Thank you. Uh, I, I can answer that, Commissioner George. Um, far as ADA accessibility at intersections, um, 
uh, will likely be replacing all the curb ramps along the corridor from Cordova to Ingra. That is because we're doing quite a bit of conduit work and most of that work is taking place under the sidewalk. So that would require us to replace all the sidewalk and curb ramps to meet current ADA standards. Um, your second question had to deal with parking meters. Um, that, that's actually a preview of Easy Park. Um, we're, we're not advocating for extending any parking meters further east. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Gardner. Make sure I got my red light on here. <clears throat> Looks like I'm good to go. Thanks. Um, my question, I, I noticed the reference in here to the, um, the downtown comprehensive plan identifying 4th Avenue from Cordova to Eagle Street as an on-street bicycle connection. And I was just wondering if there's any aspect um, of that designation that is being considered um, for, the, for the proposed design. Uh, for this project, we're focusing primarily on just upgrading the lighting and traffic signals in this corridor. Um, we're not looking at reconfiguring the street uh, from curb to curb. Thank you. Commissioner Pol. Is the posted speed 25 miles an hour currently? It's 30. 30, okay. I just was noting that they're recommending for a encourage average speeds of 20 miles per hour in the in the planning document so i was wondering you know the curb bulbs take care of that uh they will help a little bit into constrict the travel lanes as one would travel through the intersections but ideally actually the actual purpose of curb bulbs is actually shorten the pedestrian crossing distance and as you may or may not know there's actually a, a future downtown engineering study has taken a look at speeds. Okay. Commissioner Stripe. Thank you and through the chair. Um, signals, audio, lighting upgrades. I'm sure this study took place over the last year, year and a half as it developed and brought forth before us. So my question is what impact has the new muni municipality regulations had on the relaxation of pedestrian crossing have on the impact of the way that we plan because right now you plan on where pedestrians are going to cross but I believe we have new regulations that said pedestrians get to cross anywhere they want jaywalking's legal uh, this project is not looking at uh, mid-block crossings of, of the street it's just primarily just taking a look at um, maintaining the current existing signal system, upgrading it to current standards, um, but it's, it's replacing curb ramps where they currently exist. I think at one location, I think near Hyder, there's a mid-block crossing there. I guess, so we're not attempting to address, I mean, one of the other commissioners identified that there were pedestrian incidences that have occurred in this area, typically not at cross signals. Um, you've got parallel parking along the side of the street, which is conducive for blind spots, obviously. And so, in driveway, yep. So, uh, this plan here doesn't address the way the municipality is going to be operating in the near future. That doesn't address midway cross pedestrian. And so, in one, in one respect, unless you're abiding by these traffic signals, that's the only protection one really has, so we're not taking any consideration into the new municipal standards that pedestrians have. I guess I'm looking at, is, do you see this as a gap? I don't see it as a gap, because I understand there's this upcoming downtown signal engineering project. Actually, not just signal engineering, it's, it's the downtown streets engineering project that the planning department has um, is taking a look at speeds and all of downtown is looking at um, one-way two-way conversions and and it's taking consideration of of bike lanes and complete streets 
I guess my concern is that in cities that have adopted something similar to what the municipality has, you see cars no longer parallel parking on the side of the street, but at a 45 or at a degree angle so to create visibility. And these streets aren't getting any wider unless you're going to cut into the private property on the other side of the sidewalks or the sidewalks themselves. And that's my concern here, that um, this is a great step forward, but I think the, the landscape has changed in the last six months that maybe we're fixing the, the wrong problem. That's my concern, so I'll get off my soapbox there. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Polis, are you back in the queue? <laughs> yes. Okay, go ahead. Just one more comment, and this is more of a heads up, I think. Um, it makes sense you guys can't put a lot of uh, green infrastructure stuff into the project. It's eight foot and five foot sidewalks. You can't squeeze a lot in there. Um, have you guys discussed this with the stormwater department at all? Um, it's been my experience lately that they're taking a, you know, no, for, no is not an answer to them. Um, and they, they really like squeezing that stuff in where they can. Um, any discussion about that? Uh, this time, we have not had a discussion with the stormwater people. Um, like I said, we do note that some of the sidewalks are narrowed downtown, and there's probably maybe opportunities to comply with Title 21 and make some of the five-foot sidewalks a little bit wider by stealing some of the space in the three lanes, which are extra wide. I see no further questions in the queue. Thank you. Um, I did hear a comment from staff regarding a public hearing. Um, I believe that similar to the Mountain Air Drive case, they'd like to get the public hearing scheduled up front if the commission thought there was an appetite to do so. Is that, did I hear that correctly? Uh, Chair, uh, Chair Spinelli, I, I think so, I, I was saying that uh, when I do receive the design study report application, I would just request it to be a public hearing on the agenda, but the commission doesn't need to make a formal motion tonight for that. Uh, okay, I was just going to ask the commissioners, if you wanted feedback from the commission, I was going to ask that. Otherwise, I'll just leave it alone. Okay, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Moved by Commissioner George, seconded by Commissioner Polis. Anyone wishing to pull any items for discussion? Hearing none, is there any objection to the consent agenda? Hearing none, that motion passes. Okay, we will, yeah, we, we will go to public hearing. Um, I will first read the procedures for public hearing. The procedures by which the public may speak to the commission at this meeting is one, after staff presentation is completed on a public hearing item, the chair will ask for public testimony on the issue. Two, persons who wish to testify will follow the time limits established in the commission rules and procedures. Petitioners, including all his or her representatives, receive 10 minutes. Part of this time may be reserved for rebuttal. Representatives of groups, community councils, PTAs, etc., receive five minutes, and individuals will receive three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the commission. Any party of interest wishing to appeal shall first file with the planning director within seven days of the commission's decision made on the record a written notice of intent of appeal in accordance with AMC 2103-050A-4A. Commission 
recommendations to the Anchorage Assembly are not appealable. Following approval of the written findings of fact and decision, any party <coughs> of interest may within 20 days file an appeal by filing a notice of appeal and paying the appeal fee and deposit in accordance with section 2103050. The notice of appeal must be filed with the planning director on a form prescribed by the municipality. If the appellant is not the applicant, the appellant's notice of appeal shall include proof of service on the applicant. And now we are ready to hear. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm not sure if I thought at one point there was discussion about co conjoining two of the cases. Yes. Would you like to make a motion to combine case 2023-0078 and 2023-0079? Perfect. <laughs> yes, I would make that move um, to combine public hearing cases 2023-0078 and 2023-0079. Motion by Commissioner Strike, second by Commissioner Polis. Are we going to formal vote? Okay. Any opposed to that? Hearing none, motion passes. And the allotted time for testimony in those cases will be doubled. Now we will move on to case 2023-0078. Can we hear staff's presentation, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chugach Electric Association is requesting a conditional use to upgrade and expand the Campbell Lake substation, an existing electrical substation at 1000 Southport Drive in the R1 zoning district. CEA is requesting variances from landscaping and fence height requirements. This is uh, packet uh, G2. Um, for the benefit of the commissioners and the public, uh, case 2023-0079 that I'm presenting first and then we'll um, uh, go to the next case. The Planning and Zoning Commission um, approved uh, the original substation with resolution 161-75 in 1975. The surrounding neighborhood is composed primarily of single family homes on individual lots. CEA states that the upgrade and expansion of the existing facility will improve reliability to meet the current and future needs of the area that it serves. This is an unmanned electrical substation. It will not generate significant traffic since service trucks will only occasionally visit the site. The petitioner submitted a separate conditional use application for a tower that would be located within the utility substation. That case, uh, Planning and Zoning Commission case 2023-0078 is being processed concurrently with this conditional use for the utility substation. None of the reviewing agencies objected to this conditional use request, um, the one for the utility substation with the variances for fence height and um, landscaping. The Traffic Engineering Department and Right-of-Way Division both commented that the driveway must be paved. Um, this should be a conditional approval. A uh, total of 168 public hearing notices were mailed on August 7th, 2023. Um, the uh, commission has a supplemental packet um, containing a resolution from the uh, Bayshore Clatt Community Council and an email from its president. The resolution um, states its opposition to um, the, uh, the tower um, height and and what it says in the, the resolution. Um, in terms of the approval criteria for um, a utility substation, um, the planning department finds that the approval criteria for the station, a substation rebuild um, is met. Um, in regards to variance number one, um, this uh, variance request uh, from site perimeter landscaping to allow a reduction in landscaping along the east lot line adjoining Southport Drive. Um, the code requirement is L2 buffer landscaping along the east lot line uh, because the official streets and highways plan identifies Southport Drive as a, major, a minor arterial road. Um, the landscape plan shows 58 shrubs and 10 trees instead of the 44 shrubs and 15 trees. 
the planting bed width would um, be reduced from 15 feet required to a varying width between 4 feet and 17 feet. Um, the planning department finds that the approval criteria for the landscaping, um, site perimeter landscaping requirement, approval criteria for this variance is met. Uh, the utility needs to place uh, switch cabinets and vaults outside the fence substation near Southport Drive for easier access in the event of a power outage. Power outages are common in Alaska and have dangerous consequences, especially in the winter. Um, rather than uh, a total elimination of the required landscaping, the landscape plan shows an increase in the number of shrubs and a reduction in the number of trees. The landscape plan provides 14 more shrubs than required, but five fewer trees than required. Also, the landscape plan shows the planting strate strategically placed um, to make space uh, for the switch cabinets and vaults. Variance number two. The second variance requested is from the maximum height to allow an ornamental screening fence to exceed the fence uh, height limitation. The code states, um, fences enclosing electrical utility substations shall not exceed 10 feet in height. Um, and uh, the department found that the um, approval criteria for this variance is not met. Therefore, the department's recommending uh, approval for the variance from uh, not having to provide uh, L2 buffer landscaping along the east property uh, boundary adjacent to Southport Drive. Um, the department's recommending denial of the variance uh, from the 11 and a half foot uh, tall fence, um, which is required to be limited to 10. And uh, the department recommends approval of this conditional use for the utility substation subject to conditions one, two, and three on page 12 of your packet. And the first two conditions of approval are standard. The third one is just about the paved driveway. Thank you. And uh, we'll turn to Mr. O'Dell. Uh, thank you, Francis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is case 2023-0078, and this is a request for a conditional use permit for a Type 1 microwave communications tower in the R1 district. Uh, Chugash Electric Association is expanding its communication system to allow new microwave radio control links for its control systems. The purpose of the communication tower is to provide a microwave radio link to other existing CEA substations by line of sight. The proposed height of the tower is required to clear the tree line and create a direct line of sight to CA's other substations referred to um, as Raspberry and Rutherford. Uh, CA states that the upgrade of the station and new tower will improve re reliability to meet current and future needs of the area that it serves. The R1 district allows a type 1 tire that does not exceed 65 feet provided it meets the 200% of the maximum allowable or actual tower height from any principal structure on residentially zoned land. The proposed tower exceeds that 200% separation from any neighboring principal residential structures. In, the, in findings for the conditional use approval criteria, staff finds that condition one has been met. Uh, Anchorage 2020 comp plan talks about communications and that proliferation of transmissions and receiving facilities. Uh, is likely and that issues are those are of increased capacity and speed for voice, video, and data transmissions and possible visual and other impacts associated. Staff finds that condition two is met. The proposed type one tower is allowed by conditional use permit in the R1 district. Staff finds that uh, condition three uh, is met or may be met by conditions of approval within this uh, staff report. The minimum separation distance is met, the tower is 65 heat, feet high, and the nearest protected land use is a residential structure approximately 137 feet southeast. Uh, tower uh, item C has been met with the tower height. Uh, D has been met with co-location. Uh, CEA is not going to be co-locating other commercial or cellular telephone services on this tower. This is due to the placement of the tower within the electrical substation and associated security and access concerns. Uh, for condition G uh, 1 and 2 in 1, the standard is not met but can be met. So the tower is surrounded by a proposed 11 and a half foot tall ornamental screening fence with barbed wire or chain link gate with vinyl slats, which is prohibited when within a residential district. A requested condition of approval is to replace the chain link gate fence and remove the barbed wire with a side obscuring fence that meets the standards or obtain a variance. Uh, in item two, in uh, residential districts within or within 150 feet of residential districts, 
Security wire, such as barbed wire, is prohibited. Uh, this standard is not met, but it can be met. The proposed fence has barbed wire, which is prohibited within a residential district. However, condition of approval will be to either um, comply with the standards or obtain a variance. Uh, visual enhancement landscaping under item three, uh, the standards met. The associated case that Francis read, 2023-79, for the proposed substation requires L2 buffer landscaping, which is a higher requirement standard than the L1 visual enhancement la landscaping. Security standard has been met. Um, I, separation distance, towers shall maintain a spacing of one half mile, and that standard has been met. The nearest tower is three quarters of a mile to the northeast. Uh, installation of antennas, that standard will be met and installed in accordance with FCC, uh, ANSI, and NIER regulations, and they'll have to uh, get it upon approval of the conditional use, they'll have to get an antenna permit. For K, tower lighting, standards met. FAA does not require lighting for this tower. Equipment li lighting, L, the standard is not met, but it can be met. Um, the, in the petitioner's application, they, they state that security lighting is provided and maintenance lighting will only be turned on when personnel is in the facility. Um, and ambient lighting, when it's not sufficient, you know, they'll have to turn on work lighting. Uh, however, there was no details provided to show shielding of the lighting and how it's directed toward the ground. So that's been, staff's requesting that as a condition of approval, which they can meet. Um, tower color, standards met. The galvanized steel tower will be gray and blended with the sky. Uh, M, identification placard, that as well can be met, um, and that's a condition of approval. Uh, time period for construction, the applicant states uh, they're looking for spring of 2024. And in the conditions of 2105040K8, which is telecommunication facilities, type one tower setbacks, the standards met. Um, for, this is for setbacks from the, uh, the vertical axis of the tower structure is 28 feet on the West 100th Avenue side and 30 feet on the Southport Drive side, which exceeds the R1 minimum front setbacks of 20 feet. And then in four, uh, the site size and dimension standards met. Um, as well as five, the standards met. The proposed tower and facility will not limit, impair, or prevent any of the surrounding residential or religious uses. Uh, six, the standards met. Use compatibility does not to be, appear to be an issue as the site's been in location since 1985. Uh, the proposed tower meets the, the um, compatible use of scale, traffic, noise, and vibration, and lighting. Uh, seven, um, that standard has been met. The proposed tower is set back from the property line and uh, no significant adverse impacts are anticipated. Um, standard eight has been met. The official streets and highway plan identifies Southport Drive as a minor arterial and that section of West 100th is a collector. And it's, the site has an unpaved driveway which is a condition to uh, pave that driveway as part of the packet. Staff finds condition nine has been met. The proposed facility will not require more public services than the existing substation and will continue to be located appropriately in relation to its needs. So with that being said, staff uh, recommends approval of the conditional use permit for a 65 foot tall type one communication tower uh, subject to standards one through four found on page 11 of the staff packet with one minor um, addition, as I mentioned before. 3A will need um, to, at the end of that sentence, we'll, if the clerk can just place or obtain a variance. So that relates back to the site of securing fence for the chain link and barbed wire. So they'll either have to comply or they can obtain a variance. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Seeing no questions for staff, we will now hear the petitioner's presentation. Please state your name and you will have 20 minutes. Mike. Hi, uh, I'm Casey Volk with Three Tier Alaska, consultant for Chugach Electric Association for the permitting of the proposed Campbell Lake substation rebuild. Firstly, I want to thank the Planning Commission and thank the staff for their uh, report presentation. 
Uh, the purpose of this hearing is to request Planning Commission approval to issue a conditional use permit, case number 2023-0079, to rebuild the Campbell Lake substation, together with design variances from Anchorage Municipal Code 21.07.080H.3 uh, regarding fence height, and Anchorage Municipal Code 21.07.080E, Table 21.07-1, Landscaping Specifications. The Chugach Campbell Lake substation is located on the corner of Southport Drive and 100th Avenue. It has been in service since 1976, distributing power to South Anchorage, including the Bayshore Clack community. Due to aging equipment and safety concerns, Chugach has determined that the substation rebuild is necessary. Additionally, rising electrical demand requires the substation be rebuilt with added capacity to increase reliability and support load growth in the area. This project is a complete substation rebuild. Chugach will be retiring all existing equipment, including the existing fence and tower. The rebuild will include upgrading the substation to meet current ind uh, industry codes and standards. The proposed improvements include a second power transformer, a new ornamental fence that is compliant to National Electric Safety Code for site security and public safety, new landscaping that includes trees and shrubs, in addition to a new communication tower to increase reliability to the substation and provide uh, remote advanced metering infrastructure, AMI, for Chugach customers. The communication tower will be discussed momentarily by Ms. Sierra Larson as, a new, uh, as the new communication tower is covered under a separate conditional use permit. In addition to the conditional use permit, CEA is seeking two design variances. First, CEA is seeking a design variance for the proposed 11 and a half foot fence around the Campbell Lake substation. The increase in fence height will enable Chugach to be compliant with National Electric Safety Code regulations, incre increase safety and security at the site, as well as provide a more attractive screening of the substation. However, at this time, CEA is willing to withdraw their request for an 11 and a half foot fence and will compromise with a shorter 10 foot fence. Second, CEA is seeking a design variance to allow relief from current L2 landscaping requirements along the eastern frontage abutting Southport Drive. Substations are secure locations that require special clearance to enter. Due to heightened security measures, substations generally store switch cabinets and vaults outside of substations. The purpose of installing switch cabinets and vaults outside of substations is to ensure the proper that the proper maintenance crews have quick access to the equipment in the event of a power outage. Maintenance crews are able to restore power much quicker if switch cabinets and vaults are installed outside of substations versus inside the substation. Additionally, restoring power quickly results in better reliability for all Chugach customers. This practice in installing switch cabinets and vaults outside of substations is, a common, is common at all substations throughout Anchorage. The Campbell Lake substation rebuild project will involve the in installation of three new switch cabinets and one vault adjacent to an existing vault along the eastern frontage of the substation. Chugach is installing the new switch cabinets and vault along the eastern frontage due to an existing utility easement. Due to the installation of the new switch cabinets and vault, in addition to the existing vault, it is impossible for Chugach to comply with L2 requirements along the eastern frontage of the substation. Thus, CEA is requiring a variance approval from Anchorage Municipal Code 21.07.080E. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss the conditional use permit and design variances associated with Campbell Lake substation. I now present now present Ms. Sierra Larson, who will discuss the conditional use permit associated with the proposed Campbell Lake substation tower. Thank you. I'll get the slower side. Okay. Um, thanks, Casey, and thank you, the commission and the staff, for your reports. Um, I'm Sierra Larson. I'm with New Horizons Telecom, and I'm representing Chugach Electric for the permitting of the proposed tower under case 2023-0078. Um, the purpose of the hearing is, of course, to request approval for a 60-foot monopole, which is considered a Type 1 tower under uh, the municipality's code um, that is planned to be replaced as part of their overall substation rebuild um, that Casey spoke to. The tower is going to be located within the substation, um, the parcel of land owned by Chugach Electric. Um, we agree with the staff on the re recommendation of approval, um, and uh, the site meets the applicable zoning requirements and is in alignment with federal and local regulations and guidelines. Um, if approved today, Chugach Electric may seek a design variance for the fencing. Um, brief overview. Tower um, currently located in the substation is uh, about a 20-foot tower 
uh, was not sized for current needs and is not sufficient for the amount of data that is now required. Um, as technology has developed, so does the needs for more bandwidth and capacity. Uh, the purpose of the tower will um, to be installed uh, two microwave dishes four feet in diameter in addition to security cameras and AMI antennas, uh, which is for advanced metering infrastructure. The new tower will add additional data capacity, redundancy, and a protective relay scheme for the power system. Um, as mentioned, the maximum height in the R1 district is 65 feet. We are proposing a 60-foot tower with a lightning rod on top for a total structure height of 65 feet. Um, this height is needed to allow a line of sight above the tree line um, for CEA to provide the required microwave shots to their other substations. Um, the tower is not planned for cellular use, but for the power utility's own essential microwave communications and remote control systems. Um, the tower is critical in supporting reliable and efficient power distribution and quick response to outages and remote monitoring of their system. Um, in conclusion, the Campbell Lake substation project represents a critical step forward in ensuring re reliable and efficient distribution of power to South Anchorage community. Uh, with aging equipment, safety concerns, and the growing demand for electricity, a complete substation rebuild is not only necessary, but essential to meet the needs of the community. The proposed improvements, including the new transformer, communication tower, ornamental fence, and landscaping, all adhere to industry, hand industry standards and enhance the overall security and safety of the site. We believe that the proposed project not only meets zoning compliance, but also offers tangible benefits to the community. In light of the project's alignment with re regulatory requirements, benefits to the community, and CEA's commitment to providing service, we respectfully request your approval of case 2023-0078 and 79 uh, for, the com for the communications tower and substation rebuild, um, along with the design variance. We believe that the project will contribute to a more resilient and reliable power supply for South Anchorage uh, reinforcing CEA's commitment to powering the future. Thank you, and any uh, remaining time in the presentation will be reserved for questions. Um, your time can be reserved for rebuttal, but and er, questions are free. Sorry, that's what I meant. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Strike. Yes, thank you, and this is for New Horizons. Th this may seem like an odd question. Who will physically or actually own this tower? Chugach Electric will. Okay, so New Horizon, will they be, you're just here for the permitting process? Yeah, we're a consultant for them for the permitting process. Do you not also build towers and operate towers on behalf of other telecommunications? We do, yes. Okay, so th this goes to the next part of the question. If you're building a 65-foot tower, how you choose to use it with the 5-foot um, lightning rod, yep. why not use it for other communications? Um, in, or, I mean, we're, as, as, a, as a community, as we try to minimize the number of cell phone towers or other communication towers around, here's one that's now being put in place in a key area. Might it also behoove a commercial application to? Yeah, no, thank you for that comment. Um, uh, Chugach Electric has, um, be, with it being a substation, it's got cr a lot of critical infrastructure in there and some specific safety and um, access requirements that don't necessarily, um, I guess, align with a typical tower site where you're required to give carriers 24-7 access for maintenance and replacement of their equipment. So it's, while not impossible, it is uh, not a good option just because of the access requirements and the security in a substation. And I, and I saw that, and I just, in looking at the, um, your own company, does this work? Chugach has chosen you to consult and build this tower and put it in place, so therefore they've got the confidence in you. I'm just, I'm not, I'm seeing a little bit of a dichotomy here as to why it's, you know, with your, with your company at the helm there, couldn't also be used for commercial. I'm just trying to minimize the number of impact of other towers that might prop up in the area in the near future. But if we're taking all cell phone and all future communication tower applications off the table, because that's what the application says. That's what you've gone in writing. I just wanted to clarify that. You're taking all commercial applications off the table. Am I, uh, can I have a CEA representative come up and, sure. and speak? Thank you. 
Hello, Commissioner Strike. My name is Peyton Reed. I am the manager of the Transmission Engineering Department at Chugach. Uh, so we tend to keep co-location out of our substations uh, where we can't separate it completely because of the requirement for qualified personnel to be the ones that have access to our substations. So we couldn't safely let someone who works for a telecom utility into a substation unless they could qualify as a person who is a uh, who can be in a substation, so like a lineman or one of Chugach's engineers, and they tend to not have those people. So we would have to have a safety watch anytime someone would need to access the substation. So they tend to also not want to be in our substations, because then they you. can't access okay. our equipment. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Gardner. Thank you. Um, my question, I guess, relates to the height of the tower, just to make sure I understand exactly the, um, I guess, the reasoning and benefits from it. And specifically, I'm curious to understand what, um, well, I guess I heard reference to the need for line of sight communication with other towers as justifying the height. And is that a, is that a new form of communication that doesn't exist with the current tower, or is it a different nature of communication or what um, what's provided that the, the current 20 foot or whatever it is tower doesn't provide? So the amount of data that we get from a substation has greatly increased since uh, that tower was installed in about 92. Uh, so the need for faster microwave communications is really what this and this tower and the antennas will provide. It's a much faster speed than the current system can provide, so we get better quality and more data back from our substations uh, to be able to monitor and control equipment. We can't really do that now with the slower speeds and the amount of data that the current tower can process. So if I may just have the follow-up for clarification. So how much of that, how much of that function or the, the increased capacity for data transfer is a function of the new technology with the tower and how much of it is a function of the, I guess, an improved line of sight that doesn't exist with the current tower? Uh, I don't yeah. know if that makes sense, but... I think they're sort of intrinsically linked. To have the tower have this line of sight and use the updated form of communication is sort of linked to tower height. So does, maybe my, maybe what I'm, the piece I'm missing then is does the current tower use a different communication technology? It's sort of like dial-up internet versus like fiber to your home type thing. Okay. I was just going to say the, the existing tower there, it's a 20-foot tower and its current purpose right now, it just for comparability's sake, it um, has about one and a half megabits per second uh, data transmission, and its only use right now is to send information back to the dispatch office at Chugach Electric. This new tower, 60 foot tall, um, is essentially going to give them 160 times the amount of bandwidth, so 250 megabytes per second, which will allow um, upgraded capability for them to be able to remote uh, read all the meters uh, up to, I think, 15,000 community members. The, um, the microwave and the meters are two different systems. Yes. So um, it's just the amount of data transmission that's going. So the microwaves will allow them to transmit all the data to their other substations and back to their headquarters. So Thank you. Hopefully that answered. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Moving on to Commissioner Ron. Uh, thank you through the chair. My question is about tower design. I believe I saw in the packet some prior references to a lattice tower, and my understanding is we're looking at a monopole now. Can you speak to that evolution, please? Yes. So we went to the community council uh, for our uh, presentation to them, and they expressed that they did not like the lattice tower that we were originally proposing. They would prefer a monopole, so we made that change out. Um, so that it would look more like a light pole from the ground. Okay, Commissioner George. 
Thank you to the chair. <clears throat> There's a document in the packet here on page 57 at, uh, of case uh, 79. And it says summary of community council meeting. This is from the March 16th uh, Bayshore Clack Community Council. I don't know if this is something that was provided by the community council or uh, if we have the genesis of, of where this originated. The, uh, um, the applicant uh, writes up a summary of the, the meeting and provides it with their application. Okay, thank you. So it's not from the community council, so it's... It's not written by the community council. The document was written by the applicant and included with their application. Thank you. Um, so there's two questions in there, and I, I apologize if you don't have a copy in front of you. I'll, I'll just read the two questions because um, they stood out to me a little bit, and, and maybe the design has changed along the way. But um, the first question is, could the 20-foot antenna meet the same function as the 60-foot tower? Answer, no, it doesn't have any connection to the, for the AMI system. The new tower will improve the AMI system. The second question, which is uh, the third one on the page there, is does the tower have to be 60 feet? Uh, answer, CEA has done everything possible to limit the height of the tower. However, the height is based on the surrounding tree line. So going back to the comments that were uh, made here recently about the difference in speed between the uses of the 20-foot tower versus a 60-foot tower, it sounds like we have um, may be slightly in contrast with some of these answers where the 20-foot tower is doing some communication and processing data, but overall it's a systems issue from a 30-year-old system that can't handle this amount of data. Would building a, a new 20-foot tower have a higher data rate? And if so, why 60 feet if it's not based on the tree line, if it's really based on data speeds? And I feel free to punt to someone who's maybe specializes in this area. Thank you. So the... It, as I spoke about before, it's sort of like dial-up versus fiber to the home. So to get that higher speed, we need that line of sight. And the current tower does not have as good of line of sight as we need to get that higher speed. And to process the amount of data that we would be getting from the substation uh, to support the second transformer, to support the uh, modern equipment that modern monitors the substation that we didn't have 30 years ago to support the security cameras and everything else in the substation, you need that higher speed of data, to that faster connection. It really allows our, our dispatch to monitor what is happening in the substation and respond in a m much quicker time. Thank you. And maybe you can help me understand. Uh, maybe you can help me understand if there's, uh, or, or, or parse this out a bit. It's, it sounds like, um, so if it's purely based on line of sight, um, how do we come up with, with 60 foot? Is, maybe you can help me understand a little better why we've got data transmission now, but at a slower speed. Um, but there's a reference to it being older technology. I'm just I'm a little confused. Maybe you can help me. So it's sort of all of it together. We ha do have an older system. Uh, we do have a n not of great line of sight, so it's, it's not as strong of a connection as we would like. Um, and, it, and you can see in our renderings here the height of the trees that exist there that we're just trying to see over. Um, that 30 years ago weren't as tall. Uh, so we're trying to plan out and create a stronger system with a better connection um, than we have now, sort of like upgrading from a 3G system to a 5G system, I guess in cellular terms. Uh, does that help at all? A, a little bit, thank you. I, uh, I, I'm, we may get to discussion as a as a body, and, and uh, I might be the only one with these concerns, but I, I appreciate your no. answers. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the questions. Um, so, so does that answer your question? Maybe I haven't thought my question through well enough. Maybe it's a fair way to put it. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Krishna. Um, I'll ask the question about why here, um, which is another question that I saw from the community. So, um, you know, 
I guess the place to start is how many substations or, or towers of this sort does Chugach have across the bowl and how many do you need for adequate coverage of your service area? And I, I guess I'll just ask the question of um, why is this the location that this tower needs to be in? Why couldn't it be a mile away or at a, the, the next substation over? So in order to get data back, we would have to have some way to get that data to the tower. So if you look at our substations, uh, any of the newer substations are going to have a tower of some sort. The older substations are, are going to have the sort of 20-foot tall tower that exists there currently. Uh, but any tower or any substation that we've done in the last few years is going to have a tower like this. I, I know a couple of you were uh, here a few years ago when we rebuilt the Debar substation that already had a monopole tower. So they are, pretty much all of them are moving in that direction unless there is fiber in the area uh, and there's no fiber in the area here. So if we didn't have a tower, we would either have to put fiber all the way back to another tower, which would probably require two fiber connections actually, so you have redundancy because otherwise you lose reliability, or you can't have any control of your substation. You can't monitor any equipment. You don't know what's happening there, and that is not a situation we want to be in. Thanks. I just have one follow-up question, which is what is the height of that DeBar um, road tower or any of the other towers that are, were built at the new substations? Uh, so it depends on the area, what the line of sights are. I believe DeBar has a height of about 45 feet. The one before that at Haines substation, I believe, was the same as here, uh, 60 foot with the ability to put the five foot antenna on top. Thank you. And the, those were both in residential areas, by the way. Commissioner Gardner. Thank you. <clears throat> and I um, apologize to the commission and I guess everyone here to go back to my question on height. I think, I think this will be a, a quick one. And I, I heard you responding to um, the questions from um, Commissioner George. And, um, and I, I, it triggered a rethinking in my mind of how I'm thinking about the height. And I just wanted to run it by you <laughs> to see if this is a, an accurate way to think about it, which is that I had originally been thinking of the height as, or, or the need for line of sight as kind of like a, like a binary, like you needed to have a connection or you don't have any connection, but I, I think I heard you maybe say it's not so much that as, as it, it improves, if you have a clean line of sight, it improves the quality of the connection, um, such that if it was maybe lower, it wouldn't necessarily mean you wouldn't get any connection, it just doesn't necessarily give you as, 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 as clean of a connection as you would like. Is that fair? Um, good evening. I'm Paul Johnson. I'm the Vice President of Control and Communications. So I think I can clear up some of that line of questioning. So in particular, if we contrast the existing 20-foot tower to the new 65, there is a difference in technology. Um, and the difference in technology does two things. One, you get additional bandwidth, which means higher data. Um, so we go from the existing tower at 20 feet has obstructed line of sight through the trees in the area across to the east um, with significant signal degradation, but because of the low data speeds and the narrow bandwidth and the, the band that it's in, it's 900, uh, 900 uh, megahertz band, you are able to get enough data for the current use. Um, at some point, that path will even be obstructed. I think we're down from, typically you want to operate those at about 60 dB and I think we're about neg 75 right now, so we're, we've cut in significantly into the fade margin we have for that path. So at some point, even the existing 20-foot tower with the, with the trees growing up around it will cease to operate. Um, with the newer technology in the microwave band, um, this particular site, I believe it's in the 11 gigahertz band, you go from, um, say, on the order of 100 kilohertz bandwidth to 30 megahertz, that's what gives you the additional capacity. That, if you were to take those antennas from that radio, put them on the 20-foot tower, you could not get 
that link would not operate. So it isn't a matter of more data better with the height of the tower. It's the, it, it's the height of the tower and the technology that as a pair is engineered to provide that solution. That solution will not work at 20 feet. So that um, additionally, the uh, additional height supports the advanced metering infrastructure collector site. So all of the meters in the area can communicate back to that manufacturer requires those antennas to be placed at 60 feet, 40 to 60 feet. So essentially the engineered solution at 60 feet is not compatible with the 20 foot solution. So I don't know if that clears up the questions. It does for me, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Strike. In follow-up still to that same conversation, um, my recollection is that when we had cell phone towers and the proliferation, we moved from analog to digital. And as an analog system, we had much larger antennas spread out across the Anchorage Bowl. When digital came about, we saw a significant influx of more antennas with the increased technology, but the antennas grew shorter. We just had a lot more of them because of how they communicated and so forth. So the technology is not in the pole in the tower. The technology is in the equipment that goes on the tower. And so this particular tower is 60 feet, line of sight, communicating with, the down, with your main corporate office, which is what, Midtown? Is that correct? So it actually communicates with our Rutherford substation, which is off of Old Seward near 94th. So you're hopscotching, yeah. you're, you're bouncing. And so what the, what the communication companies had to do is that they had to proliferate and put more towers in. Mm -hmm. And granted, not 100-foot towers, not the 160-foot towers, they ended up putting a significant amount of 45-foot towers then around the Anchorage Bowl mm -hmm. to handle the new technology and the equipment then that needed to go on it. So Chugach only owns so much land, has what they can control, and the desire is to place that, those towers on their facilities so that there's a drink one-on-one -on -one link between their substations. What's to say that you can't have more towers in between or co-locate with other communication towers? I know you've got security, you want to control the infrastructure that the Chugach operates in and whether that can be overcome or not. Or you go out there like many of these other communication companies have done and create more 40, 45 foot towers in order to link their systems together. 65 feet gets you so far until the trees grow, you know, 10 years from now. Um, we see, are you going to back in the same situation? Oh, we need higher towers now, they don't talk. Um, so if we're planning for the future, let's get, figure out your network. It seems like we're going out there planning a pole, planning a stake in the ground and say, this is the one that's going to be used to talk to that, that substation or this substation based on what we have here today. I'm not trying to redesign the system, obviously, but I'm trying to address community needs and requirements and their impact that they have when they see shoot for the stars and come down, or if that's an option, or to lay out a plan. So, well, we all live in this community together. And, and Chugach does try to build out our towers so we can connect them together and have multiple lines of sight to things. We are required to follow cybersecurity and critical mm -hmm. infrastructure protection mm -hmm. requirements uh, that do in a lot of cases preclude us from sharing uh, data like that and, uh, and co-locating with others to try and protect our, our information from getting out that we don't want other people to have access to to be able to you know, control our substations. Uh, so we, we are sort of limited there in what we can do. We, but we do put up towers where we can, and you'll, that's why we have towers in, in a lot of our substations in the, in the legacy Chugach system. You'll notice towers in pretty much every substation. In the legacy MLMP sta uh, stations, um, there is some fiber downtown, so you won't, won't see towers there. How far away is fiber to this site? Um, our main headquarters at, at, off of Minnesota, and 
in well, international. Well, surely there's fiber lines that. It's the same thing, a critical infrastructure. So sharing fiber. So a dedicated T1 line going directly you to would, your site. Yep, we'd have to run one all the way back from this site to our headquarters. And then you can't just have one line of sight. You gotta have, you gotta have redundancy in case someone oh. cuts through your fiber line. So you'd have to run a second one all the way to the nearest substation, which is most likely Rutherford. Yeah. I mean, there are there are bandwidth within cyber within fiber that you can have dedicated fiber that comes into one site or another. And I didn't mean that you're sharing data. You're just co-locating equipment on the same pole. Doesn't mean that you're sharing data. No, I, it's it's that we would have to lease the fiber from someone else, so we would not have control of it, and that runs us uh, against the critical infrastructure and and cybersecurity protocols that we now is that a law is that a regulation is that a requirement is it's, that it's a, a regular it's a regulation that was adopted by the rail belt utilities uh, and is a part of what the new electrical uh, reliability organization okay. is going to monitor and control it's based off of the NERC ones in the lower 48. Okay. Appreciate the education. Thank you. I see no more questions. Oh, Commissioner Pullis. I'm going to tone it down a notch on the tower and just talk about the wall one time. Um, so it's, you guys are proposing a 10 foot high wall, which is allowed up to 10 feet, but then you're adding a foot and a half barbed wire on top, correct? So the wall itself was going to be 10 and a half feet and then a foot of barbed wire. Oh, okay. And we were going with the taller wall to block more of the substation view uh, to make it nicer looking for the neighborhood. But if, but if we can't do that, then we can't do it. And well, I wanted to follow up on like, it's the national electric code for the height of that wall. It starts at seven feet. Is that what I read? And then, so I'm just wondering how you guys went from seven feet to the 10 and a half. What's, what's the connection there? So it's the NESC, the national electric safety code gives a base height of seven feet that you have to have, but we often get more than three feet of snow here. Like we did last winter. So you get three feet of snow. If we started at a seven foot tall fence, you're below that seven feet. So we went with, uh, a 10 foot tall fence, but then chain link only comes in one foot increments. So we ended up with the two catch standard of a 10 and a half foot fence, nine and a half feet of, of fence height, and then a foot of barbed wire on top so that we could have six inches of the fence below grade um, to help prevent anything from getting under the fence. Um, and so we were going with that still as our standard because that's our gates are still made out of chain link. I think Commissioner Strike and Commissioner Spinelli were here back when we discussed the uh, amendment to the code uh, and with the allowance for the gate still being a, a chain link even if, with an ornamental fence. So we were trying to match our gate height to the fence height so it didn't look weird. And just one last question. Um, has either anyone asked the two neighbors that can see the wall if they have an opinion on the situation? Um, we mailed out letters to everybody. Uh, no one had any comments on the wall height, actually, okay. o only on the tower. Thank you. I think we are done with the questions. Thank you. Okay, we will open the hearing to public testimony. Individuals have six minutes and groups have ten. Anyone wishing to testify? Please state your name and let us know if you're an individual or representing a group. My name is Margaret Louie. Uh, I should disclose that I retired uh, from Chugach Electric uh, eight months ago. So I don't have a conflict of interest, but <laughs> I did want to disclose that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I you please? I'm sorry, can you please spell your last name? L O U I E. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you today on behalf of the 789 homes 
in our beautiful community to express our deep concerns regarding the proposed installation of a 65-foot monopole tower by Chugach Electric at the entrance of our subdivision. This Chugach substation was built decades ago before our two-story height restrictions and strict land covenants were enacted. And we believe that allowing such a towering structure in our premier community would mar its desirability and could pose risks to public safety. First and foremost, we believe that the proposed tower is unnecessary. Chugach Electric currently relies on other substations for collection of smart meter data. In Southport, all electric and telecommunication lines are buried. With modern technological advancements like fiber, there are more efficient and visually appealing options to handle the utility needs of our community well into the future. Also, according to Chugach's statements, the proposed tower is redundant and is not one of the primary substations currently collecting wireless smart meter meter data from our homes. It works fine as it is right now. Chugach Electric is using a 20-foot antenna. Their current application is for an unprecedented 65-foot tower in a, in a substation adjacent to a carefully planned PUD of high-end homes and townhomes and is in stark contrast to the rest of their substations, which are located next to commercial and industrial areas, or open, unused land, or areas with unkept rental properties. Also, we are concerned about the potential impact on public safety. The proposed tower would be located at the closest corner of the substation property to a bustling intersection that serves as a vital artery for our community with bike trails, pedestrian walks, and cars carrying children to and from nearby schools as well as commuters going to and from work. The Muni Traffic Department reports a busy intersection with 26,000 cars per day, 60 bikes, and 80 pedestrians per day. Also, this intersection is known for its high winds. It's in a wind corridor with speeds often exceeding 60 miles per hour. We cannot ignore the fact that towers do occasionally fall down. Such an event could be deadly. In conclusion, we urge Chugach Electric to be a good corporate citizen and neighbor. Together, we can work towards a solution that preserves the beauty of our neighborhoods ensures the safety of our residents, and modernizes Chugach's aging substation in compliance with Homeland Security's requirements for electric utilities. Thank you for your attention and consideration. We do have, um, we, do, we, do, <laughs> we do take issue with the, uh, these renderings. Uh, they, are, they are not, they don't measure out accurately. Um, I have, This, this is what uh, 65 feet looks like. There are no trees. Uh, it would be impossible with vegetation. And it really wouldn't matter how high the fence is. You are not going to block out 65 feet uh, in the air. So without camouflage, this will become an eyesore. The... Uh, depictions here, I don't think, <laughs> they certainly are not to scale. Uh, and they obviously, wh whoever, whatever engineering outfits, there's two of them, that put those together didn't take the time to really do it to scale. They were trying to make it look like uh, this tower would just kind of nestle in among the trees. There's no, there's no nestling. <laughs> it's 65 feet and the highest trees uh, the light pole is 24 feet. 
So you can see that the surrounding trees are 30, maybe 35 feet, but there's nothing 65 feet. And of course, the other objection we have uh, is there haven't been power outages. It's working fine the way it is now. We, we don't want to sound like we're against technology. We aren't. But we believe that uh, fiber is the way to go, not more towers. And once a tower goes up, it never comes down. So uh, f for our community uh, of 789 homes, uh, this represents quite a, uh, quite a uh, visual, uh, the visual impact is uh, horrific to us. The 20-foot antenna, uh, that's fine. They've got a 40-foot uh, at Jewel, Jewel Lake. So, I believe you. you actually have four more minutes. Are you truly representing uh, an association? Yes, I'm a director on the Discovery okay. Heights. Then you actually have four more minutes, and oh. and we have questions for you okay. also okay. if you want. If yes, I'm a director on the Discovery Heights Owners uh, Association board. Okay, are you are you done testifying and ready for questions? Yes. Okay, uh, Commissioner Krishna. That, that was my question, was who you were representing. Um, thank you. We have issued a resolution uh, as a board representing the 81 homes in Discovery Heights against uh, this tower because we believe it's unnecessary and the height is, <laughs> it's outrageously high. Are there any more questions? Also, I think what disturbs us I, is that Chu Getch has not tried to work with us as a community uh, and tried to seek a balance between what they want and what we want. Okay. Well, um, thank you for your time. There's okay. no more questions. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify? It's still on. <laughs> um, my name is Kate Potosky. I'm an individual uh, living in Discovery Park. Can I, you, sorry, spell your last name, please? Sure. It's P as in Paul, E T O S K E Y. I'm here to speak in opposition to the uh, permit and the variances requested. I've lived in Discovery Park for 15 plus years and began working for the developer of Southport, who was Carr Gottstein, in the 1980s um, until just a couple of years ago. So I think that makes me privy to a, some of what it took to create this particular community and also somewhat, some of what it takes to maintain it. I know that in today's Anchorage, there are very few examples of projects that make our city more livable, but Southport is such a success story. The installation of a 65-foot monopole uh, with equipment now, as I understand it, outside of the substation um, at the intersection of 100th and Southport Parkway will forever change the aesthetic of our planned community um, of almost 800 homeowners, rather, who live with restrictive covenants. Um, as an example, each one of our HOAs, you know, has different restrictions. But me, for instance, I would not be allowed to plant a forget-me-not next to my unit. Uh, that alters my original landscaping package, but yet now to allow a 65-foot pole at the entrance slash exit of the neighborhood kind of demonstrates how we're not keeping with the design of a planned community. Um, I think to scar such a beautiful and heavily used 
by different users, uh, heavily used intersection for such little or no tangible benefit does not seem a good trade-off to me. Aesthetics are not the only concern. Safety is also a factor. Uh, th thousands of users pass through this intersection each year. Margaret recited some of the numbers, uh, which are per year, as I understand it, from MOA traffic. Our bike paths are used by many residents of Anchorage, not just Southport residents. Some pedestrians are children, as Margaret said, walking to and from Mears Junior High. Some are youth sports teams that use the trails for training. Um, so a fall down of such a pole would be catastrophic. Reliability of, of the electric service is not a problem. Despite our area being in high winds, I've rarely lost power in the last 15 years. Um, many of my neighbors um, testified to the uh, same at the community council meeting. My service is extremely reliable. Additional growth for uh, the load with, will not uh, happen in Southport. Um, because our community has been built out. There are only two lots that remain unsold in Discovery Heights, which are owned by the developer and have been available for some time. Um, the rebuild for the Campbell Lake substation is not for growth, as there is none to be expected in Southport. I'm told that uh, this particular substation is redundant, only used as a backup. The Jewel Lake Station being the primary is slated for underground improvements per the current Chugach five-year plan. So why would our substation serving nearly 800 homeowners in a planned community and near an intersection uh, used by thousands for work and pleasure not qualify for the same? Is the rebuild a want or a need? And uh, after listening to Peyton, um, it occurred to me that the improvements proposed offer no benefit to Chugach consumers, although perhaps to Chugach itself. And I kind of think of it as the working remotely concept. You know, while advantageous to workers, it maybe offers nothing to the end user or consumer. So <clears throat> um, our, C our community council, which is Bayshore Clatt, submitted a resolution um, in opposition uh, back in May, actually, of this year. Many of the questions asked at the meetings, which I attended, and since, have not been answered. Um, the renderings, as was mentioned, don't really accurately reflect the height of the monopole or the landscaping around it. The variance for landscaping appears to be a downgrade with trees removed in favor of shrubbery. The masonry fence would be an eyesore and camouflage for the gigantic pole isn't discussed adequately. I would just implore you to consider these quality of life issues in depth as you try to balance our residents' safety concerns, et cetera. Thank you. <laughs> Thank time you. Is, time is up. Uh, are there any questions? I see no questions. Hi, please state and spell your name for the record. Mike. Okay. Um, uh, good evening, members of the commission. My name is Janice Zilko. I uh, spell Z as in zebra, I-L-K-O. And I am a resident of the master plan community known as Southport. And I am also an elected board member on the Southport Master Association, as well as a volunteer member of the Southport Master Association Landscape Committee. Um, I am here to oppose the permit for the tower. Um, 
and I would like to give a few reasons. Um, the Southport Master Association maintains landscaping and aesthetic features along Southport Drive, as well as we own the adjacent tract um, called the Bayshore West Sign Reserve that is immediately adjacent to the substation along uh, West 100th Avenue. Uh, the sole purpose for the existence of this parcel is to create an attractive entrance for the Southport community with a landscape monument sign and a 50 by 100 foot strip buffer uh, vegetation to screen the substation along 100th Avenue. Um, I am opposed to the construction of a 65 foot microwave tower at this site. I have not been convinced of the need for this permanent tower that will re still remain an eyesore in our community long after its functions have been replaced by the undergrounding of electrical facilities and the newer fiber optic technology that is coming. Our neighborhood, which is served by this electrical substation, is built out. There will not be a future demand. Homeowners in my neighborhood are already installing solar panels on their homes, which will become more common as solar technology improves and becomes more affordable. The rebuild of the station will in itself improve the safety and security of our electrical grid with all new transformers and associated components. I have not seen a discussion of alternatives to this tower, um, the main purpose of which seems to be the wireless accumulation of residential metered usage data. I have not seen any mitigating design measures to camouflage the tower. CEA's renderings show a smaller tower nestled among mature trees but their plans show the mature trees are to be removed with the rebuild. The tower will stick out like a sore thumb. It was only located 30 feet from the property line at the Southport Drive 100th Avenue intersection. I have submitted a photo online um, to the Muni of the evergreen camouflage used on a monopole at Kincaid Park. I would suggest something like this would mitigate the visual impacts of the tower in our neighborhood. I, um, those comments are in regards to case 78, and I also would like to address um, the variance, the, the variances to de design standards uh, for case 79. Um, I am opposed to variance number one, uh, request to alter the site perimeter landscaping requirements. Uh, this existing facility has mature evergreen and deciduous trees that currently provide excellent buffering for the tall fence and transformer equipment. CEA plans to remove these mature trees and replace them with small shrubs. The shrubs will be placed lower on the slope and will not provide any visual buffer or screening to the electrical equipment or fence. Policy 50 states that mature trees should be retained as much as possible. The proposed alternative landscape plan from CEA does not meet the criteria A of equal or better to the design standard. Removing the existing buffer landscaping, which is excellent, will have a negative visual impact on the community by exposing an industrial-like transformer equipment, a tall fence, and a proposed microwave tower to anyone who passes by the entrance of our community. The proposed landscape plan from CEA does also not meet criteria C of equal or better benefits to the community. The Southport Master Association and its members pay dues that cover expenses for the landscape ma maintenance along Southport Drive from 100th Avenue South Pass Discovery View Drive. Our landscapers currently mow the grass adjacent to the substation as well as water it. We pay for water trucks and also rely on volunteers who run hoses and move sprinklers around to keep the area by the substation green during the dry summer months. CEA does not currently maintain landscaping adjacent to their substation, nor have they contributed to our expenses. Mature trees and grass are relatively low maintenance. Shrubs are high maintenance, pruning, requiring pruning uh, uh, and monthly weeding. The addi proposed addition of 58 additional shrubs will require a significant increase to our landscaping budget. The proposed plant species, mugo pines, spirea, rose, lilac, are heavy maintenance shrubs that will not be an attractive addition unless they are regularly watered, fertilized, weeded, and pruned. Um, the Muni Code requires the property owner to maintain the buffer landscaping. Can CEA provide a guarantee that they will keep their proposed new landscaping maintained to the standards of the planned community in which it resides? They have not demonstrated that in the past. Buffer landscaping that 
that was removed years ago for an underground installation still has not been re replaced as required by Muni code. I do believe this very visible new rebuild will adversely change the character of the planned community zoning district criteria as criteria E. This PCZ zoning district has standards that all 15 individ individual HOAs are required to adhere to. These two variance requests do not comply with Southport's design standards. I am also opposed to, oh, is that it? Yep, that's it. Are, are there any questions? We have questions. Commissioner Polis. Did you say you submitted comments on this case to the planning department? Yeah, but I just did so today, so okay. they probably didn't make it into your packet. All right, that was my question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Krishna. I was just going to ask if you could quickly finish up any final points that you wanted to make. Okay. Um, yeah, I just have a quick statement on the fence. Um, the, the, the design stand, I mean, Southport has kind of a nautical theme and we don't allow masonry or, or metal fences and we have pretty strict design covenants and we're asking CEA to co contribute or um, continue to adhere to those. The existing facility has a wood fence with our blue banding on it and, uh, and as well as the trees that completely shield it. And this new redesign is going to eliminate um, all the design features that were in harmony, already in harmony with the community. So we would like to requ um, request that if they do put up a masonry fence for whatever security reasons that they perhaps put the wood facade um, fence along in front of it. And I thank you for the opportunity to comment. Come on up. Good evening. My name is Bruce Schulte. That's S-C-H-U-L-T-E. I'm president of the Bayshore Clack Community Council. Um, others before me have already covered a lot of my points, so I'll try and condense this a little bit. I did want to just expand a little bit on what's been said. Um, Southport is a community of 750 houses, roughly, but uh, Southport Drive is the uh, spine for many other houses in that. There's Concord Hills, there's Bayshore, there's uh, Hidden Cove One. All, all in together, I'd say there's probably somewhere between 1,000 and 1,300 homes uh, or homeowners that pass through this intersection every day. Um, this is the front door to Southport, to, to our community. Uh, so we take it very personally. Um, the member communities of Southport, 750 rough, uh, roughly homes, spend about $100,000 every summer to maintain the landscaping along that road. And it's really apparent. If you drive down that road, it, you, you can see that road is landscaped at the same standards as Clatt Road and 100th, but, it, but the maintenance difference is really apparent. And that's how much the community cares about the quality of our, our neighborhood, the aesthetics of the neighborhood. So, you know, it's, it's not too unexpected that they're getting some pushback on this project. Um, I was an architect for 20 years, and I've been on the other side of this conversation myself, so I wish I could be here to support this project, but I'm not. Um, several years ago, we got in a big row with AT&T. They wanted to put up a 95-foot tower right next to the uh, uh, fire station uh, further down Southport. And um, it was a big battle. We finally uh, won that one, but um, it was frustrating that we had to go to such lengths, uh, in part because the Muni, nobody here, uh, the municipality uh, granted them a lease on that property uh, during the summer when nobody was paying attention. And, we, and then we only found out about it after the fact, which was really disconcerting. So I'd like to talk about the process just a little bit, if I may. Um, Gigash Electric came to the Bayshore Clat Community Council last November with just a site plan, a very, very basic site plan. What immediately stood out was the proposed 60-some foot lattice-style communications tower. And I told them right then, I said, you guys are going to get some pushback on that because of the experience we had with AT&T. And they acknowledged that. It was a very cordial conversation. I invited them to come back when they had more detail. They did come back in March with essentially the same plan. And they got a much more spirited pushback. It, basically, it was a hell no. We're not, we're not standing for that. Now, to their credit, they've revised that part of the plan to a monopole design, which, which is appreciated. 
it's still a huge design. Um, uh, Commissioners Gardner and George uh, asked some of the same questions that I had. Um, I mentioned I was an architect for 20 years. I've been in uh, network design and maintenance for the last, well, for the 20 years since. Um, so I'm not, I don't know their world, but I know a little bit about data. And I had the same questions, like, okay, if a 20-foot tower is functional, why, does a six, why do you need a 60-foot tower to use essentially the same technology just because of bandwidth? I don't feel that we ever got an adequate answer for that. But I digress. So I was talking about process. Um, at our March meeting, they got a resounding uh, no thanks. But I did invite them back. I said, look, you know, you guys got some input from the community. Why don't you, you know, revise your plan, come back with more detail, some colored renderings, accurate color renderings, um, and let's, let's continue this conversation. Because it's, it's a dialogue. I, I get it. You know, they need to upgrade their equipment. They're, they have certain priorities, and the community has theirs. It's a team effort. Um, we never heard back from them. We adopted a resolution at our April meeting in opposition to this project. And, and even then, I said, look, you know, we're, we're recessing for summer, but if you guys can come back with a better plan, uh, one that you can defend, one that the community can get behind, let's do that. And I said, we will convene a community council meeting at any time in the summer. You let me know when you're ready. We will do that. We heard nothing from them until they, we saw postings on the, on the uh, sign for this, for this meeting. Um, I was even more shocked to find out last Thursday that our original resolution in opposition was not included in your packet because the implication from that packet was that, yeah, Bayshore Clat's kind of okay with this. We were not. We were absolutely not okay with this. And I was talking about process. That's why this is so troubling because the requirement to go to the community councils, to the neighborhoods, presumably is to find out if the community is okay with the project and to address any legitimate concerns they may have. That's not what happened here. They came to the community council. They got resounding pushback and ignored it and just moved right on with the process. That's a flaw in the process, I believe. Um, so let me, let me just talk about uh, some of the specifics of the project. Um, a couple of people have already noted the, uh, the renderings and how inaccurate they are. If you look at the corner, uh, these photos that have been um, provided, there's a light pole right at the corner that's, I'm guessing, about 25 feet tall. Well, if that light pole is 25 feet tall, then that monopole is not 60 feet tall. That's maybe 40, maybe 45, if you account for distance and perspective. So, you know, it could be just a poor rendering. I've, I've done hundreds of them. I can do a lot better than that in terms of accuracy. It could be a poor rendering. It could be a deliberate effort to minimize the impact of this industrial scale tower on our front door. Now, I realize that the standards that are written for the Muni may in fact allow this. Southport is not a standard community. It is unique in the entire state of Alaska. Now, I, I, I don't want to say, oh, you know, we're better than everybody. We're not. But we do make an effort to be, to, to, to create and maintain a distinctive aesthetic. And I believe that that's not being honored here. Um, we asked, for, uh, we asked for more detailed drawings, we asked for renderings. What you see here is the first I've seen of most of this. Um, as was pointed out earlier, the uh, trees, it doesn't really show in the renderings here, but there was a screen of uh, evergreen trees in front of the existing uh, substation until, um, I don't know, I think about four or five years ago. And uh, about a third of those were taken down. They were just cut out, 30-year-old trees, cut out so that they could put a buried vault in front of the screening wall. Now they're proposing to cut out the rest of the trees and put more equipment right out in front of the wall. That's a problem because the screening wall behind it isn't going to do any good to obscure that equipment. And the mugo pines, the ground cover they're going to put in front of it, not anything more, really. The uh, razor wire or the, the, the barbed wire on top of the fence, um, completely inappropriate. There's other ways to handle that. I, get, I understand the security needs that they're, that they're addressing. Um, and let me just touch on a couple of those. Uh, it was, you know, the question was asked, you know, could this be done via fiber? Well, ACS ran fiber, yeah, ACS ran fiber all the way along Southport Drive just two, three years ago. Uh, to support a project that AT&T was doing. Now, I understand they can't share the same fiber for the bandwidth they need. It's a security issue. I get that. Um, I do question why they can't run new fiber in the same conduit that's already in the ground. 
Nobody answered that question. We asked that three or four different ways. Nobody came up with an answer to that question. Um, there are other sites, there's other towers that are closer than their main uh, facility back at um, Electron Drive um, that might be leveraged. Um, to be honest, tonight was the first time I heard them acknowledge that they're actually going to send the signal off of a, a relay station and then back to their main headquarters. I asked that question three or four times, and they kept saying, no, 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 it's got to be 60 feet because we need a straight line of sight to their headquarters. Well, which is it? Um, it was mentioned that they need redundant. If you put in fiber, you need redundancy. Okay. The tower is not redundant. Why do you need redundant fiber? I mean, I get redundancy. I'm all for it. But where's the redundancy for this tower if that is, in fact, the argument? Um, let's see here. Okay, I think I've hit all the salient points. Now, I've actually been on the other side of discussions like this. I've served on, on various you know, boards and commissions before, and uh, it's, it's awkward when somebody just comes and pounds the table and says, no, 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 without any suggestions. I actually have a couple of suggestions, or requests, if I may. Um, the first one would be that the commission consider distabling both of these proposals for now and invite Chugach Electric to go back to the community and make a serious effort to address their legitimate concerns. It's going to cost them time, no doubt, and they might miss their 2024 construction schedule. That is entirely on them. They had the opportunity last November to recalibrate, and they chose not to. They chose to try and do an end run around us, and we're not having it. Um, I think uh, Margaret and Janice have already addressed some of the specifics. Um, I do agree that moving the electrical gear entirely inside the screening fence would be appropriate. Why would you not do that? Um, that's the whole point of a screening fence. I think that's it. Any questions? I see. Oh, I have questions. Commissioner Strike. Thank you, and to the chair. Um, you mentioned the fire station 95-foot tower AT&T attempted to put in. Yes. What ended up happening? We were able to defeat that because, um, as it turns out, when that property was deeded to the municipality, there was a little footnote, and I, I credit Janice yep. with this because this is her profession. There's a little footnote on there that said the Southport Master Association had final say-so on any work that was done there. So is there no cell towers at all in your community? That, uh, there, there are. So, so the, the follow-on to that, and I think you sort of alluded to this, um, they, they abandoned that tower, and just a few years later, they went to those micro towers that are mm -hmm. co-located with street lights. Um, that got a little pushed back here and there from some of my neighbors, but I, personally, I viewed that as a suitable compromise. So they, they did incorporate them within the street lights? Yes. So this goes to the heart of your own community. It is different than the rest of the subdivisions and the planned um, divisions within Anchorage. I believe so. Um, there's no overhead lines, no overhead towers, no line of sight is, is, is done that way. You incorporated the cell phone towers into the street light aspect. Um, that was something that, you know, even as much as five, six years ago, they told us couldn't be done. Mm -hmm. It can be. Yeah. Um, I like what you said regarding the process. And I'm, I guess I'm, where I'm coming about this, the last time a utility company came to this commission looking for acquiesce and so forth, they too had not followed the process. And that was the um, MEA. And so we did as you suggested, actually, to go back and work with the community on that. Because we do hold the process very important. And being disingenuous can go against you in that regard. But we also know the need for the, re need for the community and need for the utilities to get their infrastructure and their communications and security and so forth in place. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have to find that balance. Absolutely. And, and nowhere have I heard is, you know, the NIMBY, not in my backyard approach. Um, love it when you come together with solutions. You know, let's, let's put more trees in. Let's, you know, does it need to be 65 feet? Can it be 45 feet? Um, and you're, you're asking the right questions and you're bringing the right ideas to the table. It's just that they need to be collectively heard. And my concern right now, based on what I've seen and read here, is that it's not being collectively heard. That's, that's our take on it, too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ron. 
thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Schulte, thanks for your testimony tonight. I, I do appreciate uh, the points that you walked, walked us through as the commission. I'm gonna frame my question before I get to the question part, okay. so bear with me here. Um, I'm gonna reference the letter um, signed by Peyton Reed from Chugach. It's on page 59 of, um, I believe it's the Tower Staff Packet, um, case 76-160. Um, and in the middle paragraph, it acknowledges that the work to support increasing electric loads will also ensure reliability for those living along Diamond Boulevard, Arlene, developments along 100th, along Jewel Lake Road and 84th. Um, I skipped over Bayshore and, and Old Clack because we've, we've heard some commentary about that. And obviously you're the community council that represents that area. Uh, forgive my lack of knowledge, but what is the northern extent of your community council? And if it extends north of 100th, I'm curious as to what the opinions of some of those residents might be. Okay, you kind of got me because those boundaries have been changing, but I... We've heard a lot about I've... Southport tonight. And, yeah. And, and I'm unclear if 100th is a uh, boundary for the community council? Or? Do you know? I, I think 100th is the northern boundary, at least along that stretch. It kind of wanders as you go eastward towards the mountains, towards, towards Old Seward. But I think in that, right there, the boundary is at 100th. Um, and I'm not sure, I, and Taku Campbell is north of us. I'm, not, I'm honestly not sure if the boundary is 100th or Diamond. I should know that. Thank you. Question from Commissioner George. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. Uh, Mr. Schulte, it's uh, good to have you here this evening on behalf of the Community Council. I appreciate you taking the time um, and also uh, giving us a little bit of the back history of, of how we got here. Um, as my colleagues know, I give great weight to Community Councils. Um, so I, I just have to kind of preface my comment or my questions a little bit uh, as well as my fellow commissioner, you know, while I might not be 100% convinced of the need uh, for this particular project as proposed at this location, uh, ultimately I have to take uh, the utility, uh, the petitioner in this case, at their word that this is critical infrastructure and uh, that it's also permissible under the code at this location. So as a regulatory adjudicatory body, um, we have to have petitioners come before us with where the rules are set and the goalposts don't move and what's allowable in, you know, on a property. And a petitioner has a right to come before us and request that they do something within their rights or something that requires, a, in this case, a conditional use permit. So we have to state the legal reasons why something should or should not be uh, supported by this body. Um, I go back to, uh, in the packet there's Plat 76160 where this land was uh, platted as the substation reserve. And I noticed that the adjoining plats nearby are platted in 2001 and uh, a couple of others, I'm sure. But this, it's fair to say that this substation has existed here for decades um, as a substation. And there's a, also a resolution uh, by the Bayshore West Planned Unit Development uh, approving this um, by this body in 1975 or 76, I think it was. So it's known that this is a critical piece of infrastructure to the community as well. Help us, um, if there's justification to oppose it on our basis, help us understand what that could be, if, if that's something the community wants. Um, and I give great weight to associations when they speak on behalf of people, particularly when there's resolutions, uh, which I appreciate you bringing to light. Um, I did have a question about the resolution in the packet. The version that we have doesn't appear to have a vote or any signature or anything like that on it. Um, if there is one that was adopted, could, if you could please forward it to us, we'd appreciate that. Sure. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think for me it comes down to um, we're put in a position where we have a utility telling us this is compelling critical infrastructure and it's within the code at this location. So help us out if you could, please. Sure. No, I think that's a perfectly legitimate position. So um, I guess I would, the, the, the low-hanging fruit in this discussion is uh, the landscaping and the, co and the location of some of the equipment outside the fence. Um, that seems to me the, the most easily solved. They've, they've already, the, the original substation was approved with a certain degree of landscape screening, which has now been uh, degraded uh, over time because of expansions to the substation. 
um, roughly one third of the screening trees have been taken out and there's no way they can be replaced because of the, the buried vault. Um, so I would offer that at, at the very least, the equipment that's proposed outside the fence should be put inside the fence. Um, I, I, I mean, they've got roughly one third of an acre to work with there. I, I'm not, that, that's not my expertise. So I don't know how they would arrange that equipment, but that seems like would be the easiest thing. So to, um, that one seems like a pretty legitimate request. Um, as, to the, as to the tower, um, I, it, you know, it's a difficult one because, I, again, that is not my expertise. Um, but just from what I've heard here tonight, I've heard, well, it's, you know, it's line of sight and the 20-foot tower works now, but we need a 60-foot tower because it's all still going to be line of sight. It's, it seems disingenuous. The, the argument doesn't make sense to me. And um, I asked it multiple times in many different ways, and um, I never really got an answer that I felt that they were committed to, which made me think that they were, it was more of a convenience for them, a nice to have, not a critical uh, piece of critical infrastructure. Much has been made about stability of power um, in our area. I've been living there about 20 years. Um, I, I honestly can't remember an outage that lasted more than a couple of minutes. And we asked for the data. We, we said, okay, well, if, if the power is unstable, what, where's the data? How, what has been the length, the duration, the frequency of these outages that you're trying to improve upon? And we never got that information. That's, that's objective empirical information that they could have provided that they did not. Um, you know, as to you know, whether or not the tower has to be 60 feet versus 25, I, I, I can't speak to that, honestly. Um, but uh, but they, didn't, they didn't come back with any alternatives. Like, well, we looked at this option, this one, and this one. Here's the associated cost with that. Here's why that wouldn't work. Um, perhaps they had those discussions internally. We were never given that information. The, it, the suggestion was, well, it's cost prohibitive to run fiber all the way from this site back to their, their main facility. Um, on the other side of uh, Minnesota. And, and I, I don't doubt that. I'm sure it would be an insanely expensive undertaking. But somewhere in between that and a 60-foot tower, surely there had to have been another option. It would have really, it, it would have helped get the community on board if they had been, if they'd come to the table and say, okay, here are our cards, here are the four options. And we don't, we, we dismiss these two because of cost. Okay, that's, that's legitimate, I get it. Um, and we had to dismiss this other one because of you know, technical reasons and the only possible option was this, but they didn't do that. And the fact that they didn't do that makes me suspicious. I see no more questions. All right, thank you. Is there time. anyone else wishing, wishing to testify? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. Oh, yeah, and the petitioner will have time, 12 minutes and 36 seconds for rebuttal. Hi, thank you. Um, so in regards to their claims that we never, re oh. Name again. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm Casey Volk with Three Tier Alaska, consultant for Chugach. All right, so the, to the claims that uh, we left them in the dark, uh, we actually brought this to their attention in September of 2022. We were on their agenda. The reason we had to cancel, I actually was in Kodiak for work, got weathered in for a week, we missed the meeting, I wasn't able to get the mailers out in time. So I emailed Bruce explaining, hey, sorry, got stuck in Kodiak, we're gonna to have to try to move to October. No response. Then early October it rolls around. I got to the point where I had to reach out to the FCC because I was getting nowhere with my emails. I reached out to a Bob Lowley and he informed me that the hearing in October had actually been moved to the 20th. Therefore, we again could not meet that 21 day deadline to present in October. So then we finally got on the agenda in November, which is what they're saying that was the first time we brought it to their case. At that November meeting, they uh, mentioned that they had some opposition. We agreed we'd come back in January. In late December, I reached out to the Bayshore Clack Community Council again, emailing Bruce saying, hey, we'd like to be put on January's agenda. No response. Got to the point where in January 6th, it got to the point where I emailed them again saying, 
we would like to be put on the agenda. No response. Then we heard back from a Mark Butler uh, indicating that uh, he gave me a phone number that we could call. Um, at that time, on January 4th, 2023, at 7.13 p.m., Bruce emailed us back responding, the meeting is January 26th. As all of you know, mailers have to be mailed out 21 days in advance, and I had put this in all of our emails in prior months of me trying to get in that we have to meet this 21-day deadline. He emailed me the 21 first day at 7.13 p.m. saying, we're on the 26th, therefore the next morning when I get in to look at my emails, we again fail to meet the 21-day deadline. We therefore have to push it to February. In February, same thing. We get no response. I respond saying, in order to make, uh, thank you for getting back. Unfortunately, we're not able to meet that 21 day, day deadline. Uh, can we try this again in February? Looking at the calendar, the fourth Thursday is February 23rd, which according to their website is when they have community council meetings. Uh, when would be a good time to get back to confirm the February meeting date to re request a spot on the agenda? No response. Then on January 26th, I email again saying, we are trying to find this out. He responded February 10th saying, we have we put you on the spot for March 16th agenda. So the fact that we were playing, you know, trying to dodge them, we approached them every month to try to get on the agenda. And every time we wouldn't find out either the meeting got date, we can't confirm a date, so we can't tell you. We need to be able to be compliant with Title 21. We can't mail out, we need to mail out mailers 21 days in advance. We can't do that unless we have a con confirmed meeting date. And every time it was, we found out after the 21 day deadline until March. So. And I'm Peyton Reed from Chugach. Um, so at our March meeting, uh, we showed them our proposal, our proposed site plan, and we talked about our rebuild and they objected to the tower and said not only did they not want the lattice tower, they didn't want any tower there. They didn't want any tower at all. And they asked about fiber, which we talked about being really cost prohibitive. They asked about building a satellite, which wouldn't work with any of our existing systems uh, and was also very cost prohibited to get a satellite. Uh, and so we, we went over the options with them and we talked about even a monopole and they didn't want that. So then in April, I went back to the community council and that's when they adopted the resolution. The very next month is when they adopted the resolution that you see in your packets uh, against the project. Um, and we were changing, at, 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 by that point, we were changing our design from a lattice to a monopole to try and uh, become, uh, w welcome the community's input away from the lattice since they objected the most strongly to that. Um, and then we went, I went back in May and talked to them, said, hey, we have now finished our design change. We're gonna go with a monopole uh, because you objected so strongly to the lattice to try and make it work. We're gonna try and make it look like a light pole to make it sort of blend in. Um, and so I talked about it with them in May and then they broke for the summer. And so I haven't been back because they don't meet again until the end of this month. Um, but it, once we went to the March meeting, I've attended all of the meetings that I can at the community council to give them updates on the project. Even if they're not on the agenda, I still come and give them updates. Okay. You have seven minutes and 15 seconds remaining. Thank you. Um, again, I'm Sierra Larson with Sierra Larson with New Horizons Telecom. I just wanted to speak to a couple of the points that I um, heard brought up, and I just wanted to say thank you for your comments and concerns. Um, by no means want to feel like any of them were discounted, um, but we did a lot of internal discussions between us, and as Peyton mentioned, a lot of the alternate options were reviewed, and um, for other some reasons or others were um, denied, but specifically I wanted to talk about what I heard about um, some safety concerns. 
and um, concerns about wind speeds in the area. And I just wanted to speak to the design requirements of a cell tower are very stringent. Um, I think I heard reference to a 60 mile an hour wind in, you know, in some case we're required to design up to, sorry, communications tower. Um, we're have to design up to 136 mile an hour winds. So I, the safety concerns I do not feel are um, relevant to this discussion as the design, you know, will clearly, um, you know, be above and beyond those requirements. Um, I also um, wanted to point out that there were two different types of renderings that were provided, and if you compare them, the height is very similar in what's shown on this particular rendering. Um, and I, it's just a matter of perspective, you know, there's no yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, this is this is Paul Johnson again. Just one quick item to address the um, um, the comment about um, how you achieve uh, network redundancy with a single tower. And just to point out, there's so there's in two antenna systems on there, each terminating on its own radio. Every radio has redundant um, electronic cards, power supplies, fans, and all that. So with with a single site going out to two diverse sites, that's how you achieve um, communication redundancy with a single tower. Thank you. Peyton Reed for Chugach again. Um, I wanted to talk about the area that this uh, substation covers. It's not just the Bay Shore Clack community uh, like uh, you touched on. It, it actually covers like all the way down, uh, all the way to Diamond and down to the Jewel Lake area. Uh, it covers the police training center. It covers the fire station in the Bayshore Clot community, all the way to uh, the old Clot area uh, near uh, Clot School. And this substation is built not only to cover that area, but to help cover the load of other substations in case of an issue or in case of something we need to do at a substation like maintenance. So the substation is sized to cover not only to the load that it, the, in that area that it norm, normally covers, but also the, the load of adjoining substations for redundancy there. The load growth doesn't isn't in the Bayshore Clot community along Southport, but there is a large amount of load growth going along the, in the Diamond area near Sand Lake that is covered by this substation and its adjoining neighbor, the Jewel Lake substation. Um, and so this, this substation does not just cover this one neighborhood, it covers a large community outside of that, including the commercial building, or the commercial customers along Diamond, like Fred Myers and Skinny Raven. And this uh, substation would also back up the Jewel Lake substation and Clat substations as necessary. Um, the, anything else? That you wanted to discuss? Okay. Okay. Um, one other item I just wanted to speak to was the alternatives. There's been a lot of um, concern about the visual impact of the tower and um, someone asked about a tree type tower and we did evaluate that option and it's not conducive to the type of communications that uh, CEA is providing. Those are more geared towards cellular antennas which are much more narrow, um, smaller with the dishes that they need for their point-to-point -point communication system. Um, it's not a good option. So we did take into the community's um, feedback and adjusted the tower type so it's not going to be a big lattice tower which was the preference. It's much easier to climb, it's much easier to maintain, it's much easier for their installation. Um, but we did elect to go with a monopole to try to reduce that visual impact as much as possible that I know the community is concerned about. Um, so we feel that this is the best option. Um, Paul Johnson again, one uh, final comment with regards to the, um, the need for additional bandwidth and the new requirements that are coming in. So we discussed 
um, the microwave communication serves the additional bandwidth. Primarily, it's for security cameras. It's for better remote engineering access for um, for um, troubleshooting and determining sources of electrical faults. It's the advanced metering infrastructure serving the entire community um, that's currently not served out of there, providing additional redundancy and robustness. And it's not just for reading meters, it's also for detecting power outages and also um, dispatch uses it to um, verify restoration of power. So the overall resiliency of power um, out of detection response and, and uh, restoration, that's a big part of what that infrastructure supports. Um. And I'll just wrap it up. This substation is, you know, close to built and operating since 1976. Uh, our infrastructure is reaching the end of its life and needs to be replaced to be able to maintain the reliability that the community spoke of uh, with the few power outages. The older the equipment gets, the more outages there are going to be until equipment fails um, entirely. And that is not a situation we want to be in. So we want to replace that equipment before it fails so we can maintain that reliability that, and lack of power outages that the community has come to rely upon. Uh, thank you. All right. We will now close the public hearing. Are, I guess, are there any questions of staff? Or I, I mean, for the petitioner from the commission. <laughs> Commissioner Polis. You guys just told us you looked at a ton of alternatives, but I'm going to just kind of wing one out there. Um, is there no combination of, you know, we got to save trees, obviously, but can we chop some trees down and reduce heights? Any, I'm sure you guys looked at a ton of stuff, but just to cover our basis here, there's no way to lower the height of that tower? Uh, if the community would allow us to chop down the heights of the trees, like top the trees, then we might be able to get a shorter tower, but I don't think they would prefer that either. So landscaping code requires you to have landscaping. So if you remove a tree, you can put back a smaller one and let them grow back until the point they have to be removed again. Um, but, you know, just, just trying to brainstorm here a little in case it hadn't been considered. Uh, so uh, I, I think that we chose keeping the trees to along like 100th and stuff. Uh, we weren't we weren't touching any of those to be a lesser impact to the community versus chopping them all down or replacing them with shorter trees. Uh, we, we we felt that that would be a larger impact. Thank you. Any more questions? I see no questions. Thank you. We will close the public hearing. Okay, what is the will of the body? And just remember we have two cases to make motions on. We have a motion and a second. Mo moved by Commissioner Ron and seconded by Commissioner Gardner. Would you like to state your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move in case 2023-0078 to approve the conditional use permit for a 65-foot tall type one microwave communication tower in the R1 district, subject to conditions one through four shown on pages 10 and 11 of the staff report with the add language to condition 3A to now read um, or obtain a variance at the end of that sentence. Thank you. And would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you, Ms. Chair. Um, 
I'll keep it brief. I do intend to support the motion. I would like to incorporate by reference um, uh, staff's findings as stated in the staff packet, primarily on pages one through uh, 10. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, you know, the public testimony that we did here tonight um, and my appreciation for the responses that the petitioner um, to me seems to have attempted to make or made um, to, to those concerns noting that not all have been alleviated. Um, that said, I don't believe all of them um, perhaps could be allevi alleviated. Um, my interest in supporting this motion is one around uh, benefit to the broader community. Um, um, as a member of Chugach Electric, which I, perhaps we all are, um, re reliability, um, security, uh, things like redundancy, um, as we move forward in our future of um, energy needs, um, uh, that weighs heavily upon me and um, the infrastructure necessary to support um, current and future needs, um, it has to go somewhere. And to me, um, citing it in um, an existing substation location um, in a way that attempts to take account for community concerns um, uh, is one that in this sense um, rises to the level of approval uh, for the motion. All that said, interested in other commissioners' comments. Commissioner Gardner. Thank you. Um, I intend to support the motion as well. I think um, just looking at the criteria that we need to evaluate, I think they're all, for the most part, pretty clearly satisfied. This is a use that is allowed um, in this particular area, and it meets the um, the various, various use-specific standards, including with respect to height and um, locations. And I think to my mind, really the one area that I've flipped back and forth on a little bit um, throughout the course of this hearing is with respect to um, compatibility with adjacent properties and I think more significantly just the extent to which um, adverse impacts from the use will be mitigated or offset. Um, and there have been a lot of concerns. I understand in, entirely the concern about having a, a 60 five foot tower in a, in a residential area. Um, that, that height though, as I mentioned, is, is permissible within the area and there's been some maybe miscommunications it sounded like between the design teams and the community um, or at least some inconsistencies with, with respect to what communications took place. But I think what has come through clearly is that there have been changes that have been made. I don't think you're getting away from the need for um, the improved communication and some height that will be required for that. Um, we heard testimony about a change from um, to the monopole design, which will reduce the impacts from the site. And um, I think for that reasons, those reasons, I will end up supporting the motion. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to the motion? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. The motion passes. Looking for a motion in case number Okay, now we're ready for a motion. What's the will?
So we don't get to talk about it until we get a motion. Um, we have a motion by Commissioner Gardner and seconded by Commissioner Krishna. Um, would you like to state your motion? Yes, yes, thanks. Um, I move in case 2023-0079 to approve the variance from AMC 21.07.080E to not provide L2 buffer landscaping on the east property boundary adjacent to Southport Drive subject to approval of the conditional use and any approved time extensions. Would you like to speak to this motion? Um, <laughs> yes, I, 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 I will. This one is actually, for me, I think a, a little harder. And frankly, I kicked this off to start some discussion because I'm still a little on the fence myself for this one because I didn't, um, I didn't fully capture, I think, the, the full need for this and the extent to which um, the, the, the proposed alternative would meet, you know, sufficiently meet the intent of the subject design standard to the same or, or better degree given, given the requirements here. We did hear um, some proposals from the community for other ways to kind of maybe try to address this. and. Um, and this is one where I'm just, I'm just not sure that, that we haven't fully kind of fleshed out other, other potential alternatives. I realize that that's not um, definitive <laughs> or particularly maybe helpful for the commission, but I'm open and curious for other thoughts. Commissioner Strike. Thank you. And in speaking to the motion, um, I note that it refers only to the L2 buffer landscaping and not a reference to the fencing. Was that a omission or am I misinterpreting? The fencing will be a separate motion. It's, not, uh, uh, it's a separate motion after this one. To G2. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so are we ready to call the question or is anyone else wishing to speak to the motion? Okay, we'll call the, oh, we have staff in the queue. Uh, through the chair, for the benefit of the commission, the landscape plan for uh, the substation is on page seven of your packets, um, just because it's a thick packet. Page 77 contains the landscape plan, and what's at issue is the line of landscaping um, along uh, Southport Drive on the east property boundary. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ron. Uh, thank you um, for that clarification, Mr. McLaughlin. And uh, Commissioner, my understanding of, of the potential discrepancy in that and, and the reasoning for not being able to perhaps um, um, well, let me rephrase. My understanding is that the current design that we see for landscaping in that area is driven by the need to locate equipment outside the fence line, which is not currently located outside the fence line. We heard some testimony as to why that is 
necessary, um, and uh, the petitioner is putting forward the landscaping plan uh, accordingly. Um, and as I chase that trail, to me, I, I, I as a commissioner understand why, why, why they're putting forward what they are, and given you know, staff's findings in terms of criterion being met, um, I, I intend to support the motion um, in, in its current form and am ready to vote, but understand if other commissioners are not. Anybody else wishing to speak to the motion? We'll call the vote. Motion passes. have the motion before us regarding the fence. Well, I have a motion on the table, but Francis has a comment. Francis, what do you got? So this one should be easy. They uh, um, uh, want to withdraw um, their uh, application for a variance for fence height. So the commission should simply make a motion for approval and then vote to deny it um, because they, they're not going for this variance anymore. Thank you for that. I'm trying to make it clear, yeah. Okay, uh, moved by Commissioner Strike, seconded by Commissioner Ron. Commissioner Strike, would you please state your motion? I move in case 2023-0079 to approve the variance from AMC 21.07.080H.3 for an 11.5 foot tall fence. And would you like to speak to the motion? I understand the process that we're going through but to go on the record, I like to see the taller fences in many times in these regards. But in this regard, we'll, I will not be supporting it in light of the um, petitioner's request. Anybody else? Uh, seeing none, we'll call the vote. That motion fails. Okay, we have a motion before us by Commissioner Krishna. Would you like to state your motion? Yes, I move in case 2023-0079 to approve the conditional use for a utility substation subject to conditions one through three shown on page 12 of the staff report. And it's seconded by Commissioner Gardner. Commissioner Krishna, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, I intend to support this motion. I believe um, that we've spent a lot of time discussing the um, details of this case and we've heard from both the petitioner and many members of the public 
Um, and I believe that my questions have been satisfied. Commissioner George. Thank you through the chair. I just maybe have a question staff might be able to assist with. I just am hoping for clarification on the record for why we're waiting one year for a notice of zoning action to be recorded. Um, my thinking for asking that question is uh, adjacent property owners who will be purchasing or selling homes that are going to be in the vicinity of this. Um, that seems to be why you would record such an action so that folks would know. So why are we waiting a year? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, uh, Commissioner George, um, it's a standard um, uh, condition of approval that um, the petitioner is given one year to satisfy the conditions of approval um, and uh, turn in um, the final plans sheets um, to be stamped approved. Um, that comes directly from a uh, code um, so it's it's written into our code, and we just repeat it here uh, because we don't want the petitioner to not know that they're time limited uh, to one year and think that uh, they can uh, come back in two years because they would have to um, reapply uh, for this because their approval would have expired. Um, to shorten the amount of time um, the commission does have the ability to um, determine uh, the length of time that they have to, um, that this approval would, would last um, because the code says that or as the commission determines, but uh, that's just the standard. And uh, um, if they couldn't turn in final plans in time to meet that, then we'd, they'd have to go through, put the community through, it'd be all over again and it would just everyone would feel pretty bad about that. If I could elaborate on that, I guess, a bit. The process is they don't know exactly what they're going to design until they get their approval tonight. Then they have to design it and then submit for the permits, and that takes time. So. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. And that motion passes. And with that, I will hand over the gavel. Thank you, and we will take a uh, five-minute five minute break um, and then come back for our next case. Okay, we will go ahead and start restart our meeting, um, and we'll move on to case 2023-0083. May we have the staff report, please? Uh, yes, you may. Thank you, Vice Chair Krishna. Uh, the property owner and his representatives request a rezoning of one parcel from the R3 mixed residential district to the B3 General Business District. The property has the business of Harold's Rent-A-Truck on site, and the property owner would like to place a new mixed-use redevelopment on the property in the future. There were no objections from reviewing agencies to the rezoning. Uh, no comments were received by the planning department from members of the public or community council. The department finds all nine review criteria are met for the Planning and Zoning Commission to recommend approval of the rezoning to the assembly, which I will briefly summarize uh, from the staff report. Criterion one is met. The rezoning is in the best interest of the citizens of Anchorage and promotes public health, safety, and welfare. Criterion two is met. The rezoning complies with and conforms to the comprehensive plan. The Anchorage 2040 plan has a land use designation of commercial corridor for the subject parcel. The B3 district is an implementing zoning district of this land use designation. The rezoning is consistent uh, with the purpose of Title 21 and the B3 district purpose and the B3 location requirements in Title 21. Thus, Criterion 3 is met with an effective clause of the rezoning 
uh, be that the storage, un storage yard use cease on the property since it is not an allowed use within the B3 district. Criterion 4 is met. The rezoning is compatible with surrounding zoning and development. The proposed rezoning would provide an improved transition from the I-1 light industrial property to the south of the subject parcel to the R3 mixed residential property to the north of the subject parcel. Criterion 5 is met. Facilities and services are capable of supporting the uses allowed by the zone or will be capable by the time development is complete. A future development would need to address water and sewer connections to the site. Criterion 6 is met. The rezoning is not likely to result in significant adverse impacts upon the natural environment. Uh, note that uh, in the staff report, this is shown as a second number five in the packet. Uh, that should be a number six. Criterion 7 is met. The proposed rezoning is not likely to result in significant adverse impacts to adjacent uses. Uh, note also in the packet that this is shown as number six, but that should be number seven. Criterion 8 is met. The rezone does not extend or exacerbate a land use pattern inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. And Criterion 9 is met. The rezoning will not result in a split zoned lot. Uh, therefore, the department recommends approval of the rezoning from R3 mixed residential to B3 general business with an effective clause to remove the storage yard use. Uh, and just a reminder that the Planning and Zoning Commission will make a recommendation to the Assembly and then uh, the Assembly would actually uh, choose whether or not to approve of the rezone. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for staff? Seeing none, may we hear from the petitioner? Good evening, Vice Chair, members of the board, planning staff. My name is Craig Bennett, that's B-E-N-N-E-T-T, -T, and I'm with S4 Group, and I represent the petitioner tonight. And I'll just, it's been a long night, so I'll just be brief. Staff ca covered the case well. I'll just touch on a couple of the points. This is a request rezone 1.8 acres from R3 to B3. There were no objections for this action from any of the reviewing, reviewing agencies, no objections from the community, this conforms with the comprehensive plan, which, which designates the site as commercial corridor. The proposed B3 general business district zoning is the preferred zoning district for commercial corridor land use. This rezone will bring the site to compliance with the Anchorage 2040 land use plan. And I'll conclude that all of the approval criteria are met, as shown in the staff packet. The department recommends approval and ask that the board approve this case. Thank you for your time, and I can answer any questions if the board has any. Are there any questions for the petitioner? Thank you. Yes, there, there is a question. Commissioner Polis? Is storage currently a use on site? There is some storage on site and we'll work with planning um, to take care of that as we move forward and before the resolution is signed. Are there any further questions? Then we will open the public hearing. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak to the commission. Seeing none, we will return to the petitioner for their rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't have anything else. I do see another question, Commissioner okay. Ron. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, this may be for the petitioner or staff. I just uh, want to clear up my understanding of uh, page nine of the staff packet, um, a zoning map, um, interested uh, immediately adjacent and west of the petition site. Um, could you help me understand, is that R3 or, or B3? I see on page one it looks like it's notated as B3 to the west, and maybe I'm just missing the designation on, on the map. Is 
It's B3, I believe, if you look at page 21. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. I appreciate that. If, if staff could confirm um, their understanding as well. I, uh, I newly learned that I could request to speak, so that's why I didn't interrupt right away. <laughs> Um, but uh, through the chair, uh, Commissioner Ron, yes, I, I, I have page 21 flipped open because I think it, it just shows more clearly the, it shows the individual lots and then I'm not sure why that little strip was shown there, but, but yes, it's B3. Thank you both. Any further questions? Um, I actually, I, I do have one other clarification I could maybe offer, maybe this is overkill, but uh, that strip may be showing, because the zoning districts, they do extend the streets, so that it could be that the exact border of the zoning district is a street, and so that's why that little sliver is shown. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. What is the will of the body? There is a motion by Commissioner Strike, seconded by Commissioner Gardner. Commissioner Strike, would you like to state your motion? Thank you. I move in case 2023.0083 to recommend to the Anchorage Assembly approval of the rezone from R3 Mixed Residential District to B3 General Business District subject to the effective clause of the rezoning to remove the storage yard use. Thank you. Would you like to speak to your motion? No, I, I appreciate the petitioner and the staff and the concise consolidation of this request. It's one of the shortest, cleanest, most to the point, answered you know, 98% of all the questions. So I really appreciate the brevity and the um, context that was presented to us. And I see that all the um, criteria have been met and would note that there was no um, public testimony against this. Would anyone else like to speak to this motion? Seeing no one, we will call for a vote. That vote passes. Thank you, everyone. Um, I believe the only other item uh, is adjournment, which is moved by Commissioner Strike, seconded by Commissioner Polis. Any objections? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.